Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's the first time I do an online presentation. I just got back from maternity leave, so I hope I'm not too rusted. Um, what I'm presenting today is joint work with uh, Christine O'Keefe. We, we talked about this idea actually a while ago, um, but, uh, but I, I think it's so interesting to talk about it today. So it's bootstrap differential privacy. So, so what's the point? Um, basically, you've all heard about differential privacy now. Um, it's a super clear definition. It offers very strong guarantees. I really do like um, uh, differential privacy uh, very much, uh, theoretically, but it doesn't have, uh, it had a massive impact on the literature, but much less on practice. Until quite recently, actually, where uh, Census Bureau is talking about using differential privacy, but it's starting to become um, more used in practice, but, but for a while, and still in some uh, places, people who have been doing privacy um, privacy controls on uh, real data sets for different organizations, governments, for example, uh, they weren't um, that fast uh, on getting uh, on differential privacy. And, and the main point is that uh, some worry the guarantees may be too strong. So, in too, so they might be so strong that they perturb the data too much, and perhaps we don't really need such strong guarantees is what some people are worried about. Um, and so, so there's a lot of relaxations of different differential privacy. This is not the first. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the talk. But one of them is, um, uh, but all of them, they're looking at how you can um, increase the utility of the data by losing a little bit on privacy uh, guarantees. And so what we're proposing here is we have one relaxation that we looked at. And it's called bootstrap differential privacy. Um, so, so what's the idea? Uh, I'll introduce a little bit of notation here. So suppose U is the universe of possible data sets. I'm not sure, actually I forgot to note what, um, uh, what Claire used in her uh, presentation, but basically we, we kept saying since the beginning that you need to know what possible data sets you could have. And so there's this universe of possible data sets that exist and that's um, a requirement for differential privacy. It's over this set of possible data sets that you have to look at this um, constraint on your um, mechanism. And so that exists. And then there's the observed data set. You observe a data set, and that's D. And so the thing is that uh, this U may be unknown, really unknown. Um, so perhaps you don't know really what possible values you might see. And also, if U is known, it's sensi the sensitivity, so I'm referring to the sensitivity um, of the bootstrap Laplace mechanism, of the Laplace mechanism, for example, could be very large. Uh, because differential privacy is a worst case scenario. So that is, you have to worry about privacy for people in data sets, which maybe very unlikely uh, to appear actually in, in reality. So, so for example, a data set where 99% of people are um, unemployed, right? So you have to worry, or they said where only one person is actually working and everyone else is unemployed. It's part of the universe of possible data sets usually. And so, so it's a worst case. So you might have a large sensitivity. On the other end, D is known. And you'll know what D looks like. And it seems like it would make sense to be able to use D when you think about privacy for the data set D that you're looking uh, into analyzing. And also, uh, usually we assume that D is representative of that sort of universe. So in particular, um, we have in mind here some sort of samples. Uh, so, so you've been doing a sample survey and that data set is representative of some sort of population of possible data sets. What we uh, looked at here is we were looking at how can we have some sort of differential privacy uh, guarantees, but that depends only on D. And so what I'm going to present here, so I'll present the definition of bootstrap differential privacy and how you can sort of, uh, what it would look like in practice. And so definition here, well, it's pretty much the same thing we had with the usual differential privacy, but there's a few changes. One of which is that we can't just talk about bootstrap differential privacy because we are uh, focusing on the actual data set at hand. 
will say we have bootstrap differential privacy for D, so for the specific data set. And then the only other change is um, that inequality that we're looking at, um, which data sets it should be valid for. And so in the usual differential privacy, you can vary the neighboring data sets over any possible um, data sets in the universe. Here, we're restricting ourselves to, um, so the notation here might not be clear, but basically um, individuals in those two neighboring data sets can only take values that are already um, in your actual data set, right? So, so the neighboring data set, they have to be, so in other terms for uh, in statistics, we talk about bootstrap samples or P, right? So you're imagining that every possible observation is one of the observation you've observed. And then you think about uh, what would happen if you had neighboring data sets from those observations. Um, so, so that's why we call it bootstrap differential privacy relationship to bootstrap samples. Okay, so that's the definition. Um, of course, there's privacy loss from it. Um, you know, that that happens when you relax uh, a <laughs> definition. So, but but what's nice is that you can still um, interpret very clearly what is the privacy uh, that you conserve. And so. What happens here is that you have a reduced scope of plausible deniability. So I don't think we've talked much yet about plausible deniability, but it's for me my favorite way to think about differential privacy. So the point is that because the um, output of the randomized mechanism doesn't change much uh, depending on the values of either whether or not you're in the data set, but basically that that will um, mean that the output doesn't change much depending on the values you have, you can claim that you have any value you wish for your data and people won't be able to um, prove otherwise from the output of the randomized mechanism, right? So I, I can claim that I'm super rich if I want, I can claim that um, I have blue eyes if I don't have blue eyes, I can claim basically anything uh, as long as it's something that's possible in the universe of data set. Well, here with our definition, we reduce that scope. So individuals can claim to have any of the values that appear in the original data set, right? So if, um, if, the, if no one had a salary that was um, higher than, I don't know, $1 million a year, then you can't claim that you have $20 million of income. Um, you can only claim to be one person in the original data set. But if the data set is varied enough, uh, that might be sufficient for you. Um, there is also some potential information leakage. So with differential privacy, basically the only issue is that epsilon. But here there, there's, there's a bit more issues, right? So for example, the, the mechanism itself, because it allows more varied mechanism, uh, there could be some leakage uh, by itself from the mechanism. Um, so we'll, we'll see a small example later, maybe where, where it's going to be clear how that happens. And also here, it's an uh, there's an, it's an example where you can't just publish the mechanism just like with DP. So differential privacy, we were just saying it uh, 20 minutes ago. If you publish it, you're fine. You're not losing anything. Here, if I publish the mechanism, well, you'll see uh, in a bit. But but um, for example, if I use Laplace noise addition then the sensitivity, my bootstrap sensitivity, will depend on the data set. So if I publish the mechanism, then I'll be leaking some information about the data set. So you do have to be much more careful than with differential privacy uh, if you want to use this relaxation. There's still some nice properties, though. So, um, uh, well, if the first thing is if you have a mechanism that is uh, differentially private for some universe and you have a data set that's part of that universe, then you're um, your mechanism will satisfy bootstrap differential privacy. So it's a, it's a relaxation, uh, really, of differential privacy. And uh, bootstrap differential privacy composes just like differential privacy. Um, so the composition theorems follow nicely. So, so it allows you to do all sorts of more complicated uh, mechanism, if you'd like, from the simple ones. Okay, so how do we achieve bootstrap differential privacy? Well, one of the ways to do that um, is by modifying slightly the bootstrap Laplace mechanism. So this is the only one that I'll be um, talking about today. 
Uh, this is the one we looked at mostly in the paper, but you could imagine other ways of doing it. Um, but, but this is very simple here. So basically, you look at the Laplace mechanism, but you just change. Instead of computing the global sensitivity, now you care about the bootstrap sensitivity for the data set that you have. And then you can compose as usual, like I said, if you'd like to do uh, different things with the Laplace mechanism. So what's the bootstrap sensitivity? Well, you might have guessed it. Basically, uh, it's exactly the same computation of sensitivity, except that here I only consider neighboring data sets in my uh, set of bootstrap samples. So basically, I'm asking myself, um, I, there's something I'd like to output. I want to output a mean. Well, how much would the mean vary for any two neighboring data sets that can be taken from this uh, uh, bootstrap uh, data sets? And so for those of you who know about local sensitivity, it might look a little bit like local sensitivity because I'm, I'm sort of thinking about a specific data set D, uh, but there's two slight differences, well, actually pretty big differences in what it, it does in the end. Uh, one is that bootstrap sensitivity here, we allow both data sets to vary. So both D1 and D2 will vary among possible data sets in my bootstrap, um, my set of bootstrap data sets. Um, whereas a local sensitivity fixes one, it fixes D and then it looks around D. And then there's the same uh, scope restriction that we have with local sensitivity. You fix one and you look at neighboring data sets, but in that universe you, whereas in our case, the neighboring data set also has to be uh, made up of rows of my original data. So, so it's not quite the, the same. There are a few advantages though of this bootstrap sensitivity. Um, well, the main, the main one is that it should be less than the sensitivity uh, in general, so that the bootstrap pass mechanism will require less noise um, to be added, and so you should get higher utility. So it doesn't have to be always a smaller sensitivity, and we'll see in an example that the difference is not that large in some cases, but, um, but in practice, basically here is that we're sort of ignoring the, uh, the values that might be very unlikely um, but that still have to appear in the universe. And so that should reduce the sensitivity of the function. Also, bootstrap sensitivity is usually bounded. So there's often issues with sensitivity for uh, continuous variables, because if uh, your value can take, if your variable can take any value, then you technically could have an, uh, an observation with, you know, like an infinite value, and then, and then you can't bound um, really the sensitivity. So here, technically, it's usually going to be bounded, except, of course, if you have things like I'm dividing by something, and that thing can be zero and stuff like that. But in general, it's going to be um, sort of easier to bound. And um, well, technically, because you know D, you could, in theory, know exactly what the bootstrap sensitivity is. Uh, in practice, it's going to be computationally um, infeasible, but you could still sort of uh, try to maybe um, approximate the bootstrap sensitivity by doing empirical experiments. Uh, one thing with differential privacy is that it's usually, it's usually hard to um, come up with methods that um, that privacy unless you're building up from Laplace noise addition and those kind of things. Uh, because you do have every time you have a new uh, function or mechanism you want to use, you have to compute the sensitivity. And so this sort of gives, gives users that might be a little less theoretically uh, inclined, they can try to approximate computationally the, the bootstrap sensitivity. Okay, so, so what does that look like in practice? Um, well, sometimes it doesn't change much. So I'll, I'll give two um, context, different contexts here where you could apply bootstrap differential privacy. The first one is to release contingency tables. So this is not that hard, um, even with usual differential privacy, the sensitivity is easily bounded and it's one because um, in a contingency table, every person in my data set appears in only one of these tables. So if I remove someone, change it with someone else, I'll only change um, one of the cell value by one. And so here bootstrap differential privacy doesn't really change that much except that it gives you the possibility to publish counts of zero or n directly. 
uh, right? Because if there's no one in my data, in my original data D, which has some um, properties that gives them, uh, in, that classifies them in some cell, well, even if I take bootstrap samples uh, and I look at neighbors, I'm never going to change that zero or that n. And so technically, you can publish those. Uh, if you have really large, sparse tables, you might be OK with publishing zeros. On the other hand, um, you know, from a long time, zeros have been sort of, um, people have been worried about publishing zeros because you are revealing something. So this is an example of a mechanism which does achieve uh, BDP, but still uh, will reveal some information. So you may not want to reveal that nobody in that region has this kind of profession, for example. So there needs to be some more um, revision of the results before it's, it's published. And people need to think about you know, if they feel like they can do that. Um, another example, which you know, is not looked at very often from uh, people working in differential privacy, because I don't think it's a product that is as well known outside of the statistical um, agencies world, is a magnitude table. So what's the magnitude table? I, I give an example here. So basically, it's like a contingency table. Actually, this one includes a contingency table here. right? So uh, this is about rice farms in India. It comes from the PML library in R. Um, so there's a bunch of farms, and they're um, classified according to two variables. So the status uh, of that farm, so either um, own, it's a one owner, or it's a shared, or it's mixed. I won't go into details, not super interesting for now, and the variety of rice that they produce. So there's two, there's two lines. The N line, that's the usual uh, contingency table. So there are seven uh, farms with mixed um, ownership and uh, both types of rice. But then the magnitude table is the other line underneath. So it's this part here. So this 11,187, this is saying that in total, the seven farms produced 11,000 kilograms of um, rice, right? And so uh, usually this is more interesting for sort of uh, business surveys um, where you want to give some information about profits or production or something like that um, for group of companies. And so releasing men to tables is a little bit more interesting than releasing confidentiality, uh, con contingency tables, because here there will be a bit uh, of a difference between usual differential privacy and BDP. So what happens? Well, basically, we want to release a sum, right? And so let's first think about each of the cell. So each of the cell uh, FID is just going to be the sum on cell I. And so basically, uh, oh, and, and K is going to be the number of cells in that magnitude table. So the bootstrap uh, DP sensitivity will be different for each of these uh, FI of D, and it's basically the uh, maximum absolute difference between two observations in that cell. So think about, um, let's say, removing the largest observation in the cell and replacing it by the smallest one, or vice versa. That's how you're going to change the, the sum the most. So you have a sensitivity for each of the cell. Um, if you want to, uh, we'll see later how to construct the whole table, but imagine that you care about the sum, each of these cells will have a different uh, sensitivity. Whereas, um, just a note here, if you were going to use usual differential privacy, um, to have different uh, sensitivities, you would need to have sort of different universes associated to each of these cells. Um, and then it, it doesn't quite fit uh, super well in the framework. Okay, so now if I want to raise my magnitude table, I have two options. Option one, I consider the entire magnitude table as my single output. So I have a function which takes uh, my data set and produces a magnitude table. Then what happens is that the neighboring data sets will differ only in one cell. So will change only the um, value of total in one of the cells. Except now the, that sensitivity uh, we said it, it, depended, it depended on the cell I used. Well, it can change any of those. So basically, my sensitivity now is the maximum of these individual sensitivities. So here, I would add the same amount of noise to each of the cells in my magnitude table, and that, amou and that amount of noise would depend on how many 
um, on how big the sensitivity is for that cell. And so uh, we do that, we just use, uh, yeah, so I just used the bootstrap of loss mechanism. So basically we just use the Laplace mechanism with that uh, maximum amount of noise. So that's option one. The second option is we can think of each of these as a separate output. And as I said, uh, BDP composes like DP, so I can do that. So I can think of them as separate outputs. And then what happened though is that I'm producing a bunch of outputs. Um, so what I'll need to do is for each of these cells, I add noise depending on their own bootstrap sensitivity, but then I have to um, uh, reduce my uh, epsilon for each of those cells in order to have overall epsilon um, differential price, well, epsilon bootstrap differential price. So that's option two. Uh, what's the best one? Well, it's going to depend on the number of cells as well as the variabilities of these sensitivities. So the second approach uses a smaller privacy parameter, so I need to add more noise, but it will allow for less noise in the cells which have smaller sensitivities. Um, if one of my VI is much larger, larger than the others, it might be better to use option two, uh, so that add noise to all of the other cells. Uh, and, and here I'm gonna look at the two options. Overall, you can compare that with differential privacy too. And in general, it's usually going to be larger with option one because there's a higher chance um, that the um, difference in um, the bootstrap sensitivity versus the, the usual sensitivity will be different. All right, so here's a little example just to show what happens. Um, these are the bootstrap cell sensitivities. So for each of the cells I had before in my magnitude table, I look at the difference between the maximum and minimum value. So here, I mean, you don't have to memorize all these numbers, but maybe remember that share and both has a very small one and owner and high has a really large one. Okay, and this is just to give you an idea of what both of these methods produce. So here I have, um, I have box plots for about a thousand, I think, um, repetition of, you know, so they're, they're box plots of what I would uh, publish. So a thousand possible publications for my magnitude table. Uh, I'm looking at them cell by cell. So what we see, the first method is in, so yeah, so in the y-axis is just the, um, the value in my magnitude table. Well, first issue, yeah, there are some negative values here. Um, I guess that would depend on value of epsilon. I must admit, or oh, what epsilon we use here. Um, but yeah, there are some negative values, and you might need to do some post processing because users might not be very happy with negative values of rice production. Um, and here are the cells. And so the first method to the left in blue, that's method one. So what you see is that um, all of these box plots, they have very similar um, distribution. I mean, basically, you are sampling exactly from the same Laplace distribution in all these cases. The only thing that changes is the location of the, um, the mean. Whereas the orange one, well, what happens is when we look at our here, the one which had a really large, um, really large sensitivity, then you need to add more noise. Um, and here, the one which had a very small sensitivity, you can add a lot less noise. But in general, in the orange, uh, well, in the method two, you do need to add more noise compared to uh, method one because you need to have epsilon over k each of the times. So there are a few times where it actually um, is better. So in this case, the bootstrap sensitivity is so small that even if I need to divide epsilon by k, I still get better output using method two than using method one. But there are lots of cases where my sensitivity is pretty large, and so uh, I will be better off using method one. So then it depends what your table looks like and you know, what you'd like to share. There is a third option. Uh, if you can assume that cell membership is public information, uh, which it might be in some cases, again, for sort of, um, um, business surveys, for example, then you just, you can split your data set into K data sets. And now you can do that without any loss of privacy because uh, cell membership is known. And so then you can basically just imagine that each of these data sets, there's some people that are sent in these data sets and you need to look at the total for that data set. 
And so you can do exactly the same thing as with, um, with the method two. So you add the noise depending on the bootstrap sensitivity for each of the cell. But here you don't need to divide epsilon by k because you're just sort of working with different uh, people each time. And so that would be a, a better option if you're able to uh, do that assumption. And what that means in terms of plausible deniability, which is how I always like to think about differential privacy, is now people can claim to have any of the value uh, among those uh, of the people that the uh, of the people in the cell they belong to, right? So, if I'm a group of people with really hard, uh, really high um, rice production. Uh, then I can claim that I have any of these I values, but I won't be able to claim that I have a low value of production um, that might be seen in a different cell. So there's definitely is a trade-off with that uh, assumption. All right, so a few notes here on when to use BDP. Of course, it's not always appropriate. Uh, thinking about this relaxation doesn't mean we want them to be used all the time. It's just sort of thinking about uh, what we need and uh, what could be appropriate. So I won't go into details in all of these, but um, maybe when you really know your data set, uh, you, you know that you need a higher statistical utility, you know that it's okay to have weaker formal privacy guarantees. Um, you don't know about the possible universe, you, you, you only really know your data set or the worst case scenario, uh, really increases the sensitivity of your function and it's really rare. Well, these uh, can be times where maybe BDP could be, uh, could be useful. Um, probably you don't want to be releasing all the details of the protection mechanism in this case because, as I said, you can be leaking some information uh, in that. Uh, so I just want to conclude with going back to my big picture at first. Um, BDP is just one of several relaxations of differential privacy. They all help understand advantages and limits of, of differential privacy. Um, and in the paper, we have a little section where we try to propose, well, we propose a classification of these relaxations because people are looking at all sorts of relaxations. Sometimes people propose things that aren't quite related to differential privacy and still include the word differential privacy in there. But here are, here's our um, classification of these uh, relaxations. So one relaxation people do is what we call bound relaxation. So this is really um, sort of allowing that inequality, so the ratio of the for neighboring data sets, well, you want to relax that. You don't necessarily ask that it's always bounded by e to the epsilon. So they're very well known now, uh, epsilon delta differential privacy and epsilon gamma probabilistic differential privacy, those would be part of that bound relaxations. And then there are scope restrictions, which is like bootstrap differential privacy. So what you restrict is the um, potential neighbors, right? So you really restrict them. Um, there's conditional differential privacy, which is a term I introduced in the paper, but not as a proposition for differential privacy. I just was something I needed to think about empirical differential privacy, which is another relaxation which was proposed, but actually doesn't really quite, well, doesn't really work as a differential privacy relaxation. It's not even really a measure of risk. But here, conditional differential privacy, you really sort of condition on the database you have and you look at its neighbors. And then there's individual differential privacy, uh, which is another scope restriction um, possibility. And then there's distribution replacement. So here the thing is, you say, I know some databases are probably, are not probable. They're not probable. I don't really want to worry about them. And this is what random DP does, is it um, takes into account the probability of the databases uh, which is not done anywhere else, right? So in statistics, the first thing we do when we have data set, most of the time is we have some sort of assumption about distribution for that uh, data set. Uh, you know, things follow normal distribution or exponential or whatever, but we have some sort of assumption about how the data set was generated. With DP, that's thrown out of it because you just worry about any possible data set. So this random DP is a very nice way of including assumptions about the distributions of differential of the data sets that you um, are worried about. And then there's sort of combinations of all those. Um, and so, so the point is that there are a lot of 
relaxations and we still do need to work a lot more to contrast and compare all of these, explore other variants. I think every time we think about these, they help us understand really what differential privacy does and also how it relates to traditional risk measures. Um, and I don't have time to talk about other risk measures here. I'm a very big proponent of differential privacy, but there's a whole other literature of statistical disclosure control where they don't look at differential privacy. Uh, well, now they're starting to look at it, but at first, I mean, for years, they didn't look at that and they have other measures. And so how these measures relate to some of these relaxations how to relate to differential privacy, that's very useful in practice to help people, for example, choose their values of epsilon and things like that. Um, right, so that's all I'm going to say today. There's a bunch more details and all the references. No, I named a bunch of other things. They're all in the paper. Uh, there's my email address if you need to talk to me. And I will now look at the questions if there are any in the Q&A.